Uh, should we start worshiping Gamera? I, I, I thought we already did. Every January and sometimes December. This time we watched Season 3, Episode 2, Gamera. The one where a robot sings a love song to a turtle. It's true. And in uh, some follow-up to uh, to our previous episode, also on Gamera, but a different episode, to pull the curtain back a little bit, we uh, uh, podcast broke down a little bit because we weren't necessarily sure about the names of Dr. Hadaka's daughter and the reporter who is infatuated with her. And if you look at the credits on the IMDb, they only list the Japanese names for those characters, but every other character. But if you're watching the Sandy Frank dubs, everybody except Dr. Hadaka gets a new anglicized name. And I had to go over this a couple of times because I couldn't remember. I just knew it's like, I don't think they're given Japanese names. And it was bugging me. So I, I looked through the episode and <laughs> it's barely heard, but the reporter. His name is Alex in this dub, and the daughter is Catherine. <laughs> really? We, I, th- I miss that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The actor who plays Dr. Hidaka kind of slurs it at one point, so it's like, ah, oh, that sounds like a yo guy to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that was just one of the many things that was a bit murky about this movie, not the least of which also is the cinematography. Well, now seems as good a time as any to dive into <laughs> water, the source of all life, and the source of this title. Of the title. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Before we get to that, producer Chris here, and I will be at PodCon once again in a few days, uh, January 19th to 20th, 2019. I will be in Seattle for PodCon 2. Beth and Adam won't be able to make it, but I'll be there along with friend of the show, Michael, from over at This Is Your Mixtape. We're not doing anything within the program. We're just there as civilians. But nevertheless, I'd be more than happy to meet anyone who listens to the show. So if you're going to PodCon or if you're just in Seattle and you want to hang out, then just get in touch. Contact form is on the website or you can tweet at it is just a show, and uh, I'll see it there, and maybe I'll see you there. Anyway, let's get back to some turtle business. All right. When we first saw Gamera on this show, he would burst from a metal dome in space and flew home to Earth to destroy a dam before battling Barugan, the kaiju with a laughing face. But how did he get to space in the first place? Let's taste the turtle again for the first time by watching his debut story. A jet is shot down near an Inuit community in the Arctic, releasing nuclear radiation. Where there's radiation, there's giant monsters, so it isn't long before a giant turtle bursts through the ice. Witness to this are the Inuit chief and zoologist Dr. Hadaka. The chief hands Hadaka a stone carving pertaining to the legend of a giant turtle known as the Devil's Envoy, Gamera. Gamera then shows off one of two superpowers, his flame breath. The U.S. Air Force comes to rescue Hadaka, who hits the media to warn the world of the terrible turtle. Of course, the paper ignore the story in favor of this scoop. Drunken farmer sees UFO. The UFO becomes unyued when it turns out to be Gamera. You see, Gamera's other superpower is flight, which he activates by retracting his head and limbs into a shell, causing flames to shoot from the limb and head openings of the shell while the turtle spins through the air. Meanwhile, in Japan, one of Kenny's teachers approaches the boy's older sister, Nora. See, Kenny is apparently obsessed with turtles and draws them every day. Also, he's adopted one as a pet. This is behavior no child would display, especially one whose mother has died recently. Kenny takes Tibby, his turtle, to the woods and spots Gamera. At first, his sister and father think Kenny's the boy who cried turtle, but they change their tune when they see Gamera save Kenny from falling to his death. Kenny insists that Gamera's a good turtle deep down inside. Cut to Gamera burning Japan to the ground! The Kenny Gamera May December Human Turtle Romance continues, with Kenny stating Gamera is good while the monster destroys everything and everyone around it, reminiscent of the critic sketch Children of a Lesser Godzilla. The army uses flames to attract Gamera, then they implement Z-Plan, which consists of trapping the turtle in a dome and rocketing him to outer space. Kenny vows to become an astronaut so their love can be rekindled one day. Next in the episode... The prologue opens with Joel and the bots in workout gear getting warmed up for the experiment. 
Tom Servo, resident voice coach, puts them through a number of vocal exercises. After the break, the Mads are in the middle of spring cleaning, and as a result, are a little distracted. Frank is wearing a frilly apron for the occasion. It suits him. Anywho, Joel's invention is endless salad, though the salad looks suspiciously like crumpled up tissue paper. Frank's on the invention exchange this week, a device, read, not a shot vac, that will clean the filthy bottoms of bird cages, though ugh, it sucked up the entire bird with it. In segment two, touched by the story of little Tibby, Kenny's pet turtle, Tom Servo sings a touching tribute slash torch song to the little reptile. The toilet's not your fate, friend. You'll always run free. Tibby, long as you have me. Crow badgers Tom a bit by suggesting that Tibby gave the whole family salmonella. In segment three, the bots take out their hatred of Kenny on a Jim Varney doll. Joel tries to talk them through their frustration and encourages them to maintain a positive perspective. It doesn't really work, as their reasons for hating Kenny are quite sympathetic. Joel's words of wisdom? People don't mean to be obnoxious, it's just that they're all screwed up inside. Crow ends up getting a timeout while Tom reaches out to the viewers to weigh in on the Kenny debate at Kenny, What Gives? In segment four, Tom and Crow are at Gypsy's Beauty Parlor when Gamera, actually a youthful-looking Mike Nelson, comes by the SOL. He's very chill, makes jokes about his limited wardrobe, and notes that it's hard to be big-boned in a big city. He also admits he's using Kenny to soften up his image. Oh, and it turns out he's buddies with Godzilla, and they're working on a film project together. In the final segment, Tom, as an old-timey radio announcer, salutes the cast of the movie. Their careers after this film are storied and colorful. It turns out Joel and the bots didn't think this was such a bad movie. And this angers the Mads enough that they send Joel a, quote, shock to the chamois. Hey, this seems familiar. <laughs> yeah, but it had an entirely different treatment in the theater. And did that make a significantly different viewing experience for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I really enjoyed the experience of watching the KTMA episode just because it was like watching the Sandy Frank dub more or less untouched, except you're watching it with Joel Hodgson in the comfort of your living room. Um, this is like a proper episode of MST3K. The riffs are, are particularly dense. Like there's very, very, very rapid fire riffs throughout. Uh, I especially like the running joke where uh, Catherine is mistaken for Roy Orbison. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot there's a lot of good goofs and uh i i really enjoy it but this is again a, a really goofy fun movie to watch and the sketches are great yes the sketches are very good as they always are for this particular era of mst3k admittedly after watching ktma it was not all that easy to go back to it i have to sympathize a lot with mary Jo peel who wrote the summary for the movie for the amazing colossal episode guide i'll just quote a bit this is the third Gamera movie I've had to watch for this book project, and I am empty. It's the sixth Japanese dub film I've had to review, and I'm all out of love. Please refer to the other Gamera summaries and figure it out for yourself. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, I mean, technically I've only watched two for this uh, podcast, but I've watched them twice each. I have to admit, <laughs> that's a lot of Gamera. Yeah, and Mary Jo didn't even take part in the ktma days so what's she bitching about i guess she had to watch them and kind of passively you know without making jokes just to summarize for the book well she didn't she didn't summarize the ktma episodes nobody did that's like almost a blank page no she said she's watched three gamma movies so i'm assuming that's some of the other ones that they they do a little bit later yeah which is weird why why would someone be so crazy as to not watch these in order <laughs> oops I hold some hope that the the upcoming Gamera ones, which I think are from the late 60s and 70s, are going to be a lot zanier and campier, and for that reason might be a lot more fun to watch. Oh, yeah, you're, you're not wrong in hoping for that, because uh, I have extremely fond memories of one in particular that I, I won't mention, we'll just have to wait it out, but... These films get super, super goofy. In fact, that's like the trademark 
of the Gamera series is that they're simultaneously sillier than any Godzilla movie made before or after it, but also weirdly at times gorier than any Godzilla movie made oh, okay. before or after. Yeah, they're they're strange beasts, these Gameras. Whereas the ones that we have watched so far are rather four movies about a flying giant turtle, you know, pretty straight laced, actually. Well, I mean, Ga- I think Ga- Baragon is a lot of fun. He's a wild mm-hmm. card and uh, he's got a lovable face and a weird tongue. <laughs> and he shot rainbows. I oh, agreed. I did like Baragon, but the story surrounding him, you know, the the jewel thieves and the tri- like, I was just like, okay, fine. You know, and I, I'm hoping that the human characters also become uh increasingly fun as the series matures into itself a little bit well i've got good news and bad news uh because yes i would agree that when you have a monster like baragon and you've already got a series that introduced gamera as the protagonist you've got enough you don't need a story why marry it to a story involving like ooh a sacred opal from a jungle like who cares yeah exactly you've got a dog monster that shoots rainbows out of its back <laughs> yeah so cuz i'm i'm sure i've seen them before but i'm kind of blanking on it like they're just more monster 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 going forward there's a lot more monster mashes but unfortunately this is the bad news part because that's the good news uh the bad news is there's way more kid stuff in these sequels (laughs) perfect catch 22 now consider the turtle (laughs) as we will for the next hour yes we're going deep down into the murky swamps of turtledom Mm -hmm. were were you ever tempted as kenny obviously is here to have a turtle as a pet uh when i was younger there just seemed to be more animals around in general which darkly probably has something to do with climate change but you know we lived on a back gravel road and we would often see turtles crossing the road and we would pick them up and play with them and maybe take them home and mess around with them for a couple days and then we would just let them go so but no i was never tempted to actually have one in the house knowing my mother she would never allow it i did have a friend whose older brother was really into weird animals (laughs) and he had a tank with one of those soft shelled turtles i don't know if you oh yes the infamous soft boiled turtle they're soft shell turtles and they have like these really long, almost Cyril sneer like snouts to them. Ugh. But and whenever I was over there, I was like, huh, it looks so rubbery and and weird. And he's like, just don't go near it because they have razor sharp teeth. And I'm like, where is its mouth? I thought this little snorkel thing was its mouth. But that's about as close as I ever got to being like, huh, turtle, tank. Okay. Yeah, I can't say I was ever tempted. Because, I don't know, turtles just seem gross. They are gross, it turns out. As most reptiles are, they are not easy pets to have. Which is weird, because I always thought snakes made good pets. Or they could be. Well, they are good as long as you keep them contained. And I think the main issue with reptiles is they usually need to eat live food. Which Hmm. means you have to feed them things like insects and rats and things like, not rats, but mice and things like that. So you have to have, you know... You have to be tough enough to be willing to feed a live animal to another live animal, which I can't really see Kenny doing, frankly. I I could very easily see Kenny not just feeding live animals to Tibby, but also listening to Tibby and saying, what's that? You want me to kill people in the town? Okay, Tibby. (laughs) They got a real Son and Sam thing going on. (laughs) Yeah. And another thing that... Like, we don't see Tibby for very long, but it doesn't seem like he has any kind of habitat for them. He just keeps Tibby in his pocket. Yeah. And he had those rocks later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> During the delightful scene in which Kenny is hit by a car, which I, I, I'm i not going to lie, I played several times over because I enjoyed it so much. So I've done some research on what it takes to keep, you know, a turtle pet. Mm. And I give Tibby a week before he just cocked out. Oh, no. Yeah. Is it because the shell is too soft? What's wrong? There's a number of things. Uh, turtles are very tough to keep alive and happy. So you need a tank. You know, they need to stay wet. They're not amphibians, but they like, like, they like a wet environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need UVB, like UVB rays, mm-hmm. or they get very sick. Uh, they get bone disease. So you actually have to have a special light. And you also need a heat lamp because they're reptiles. So you need like a basking area. Uh, they 
need a special diet that has a lot of, I think, calcium in it, because if they don't get it, then their their shells turn to goo. <laughs> so <laughs> what else? Do they do? They're very long lived. Yeah. You know, legendarily so. And they do grow. So people will buy these tiny little, like, you know, dime-sized turtles, but then they'll grow to be like, a foot long quite quite quickly. Whoa. Also, they hate people. Huh. They, they don't like to be touched. They don't really want to interact with human beings at all. So they're very expensive, impossible to tame, difficult to feed animals. And this is something I thought was remarkable that didn't come up in the research that I, I was doing. Because mostly people who do have turtles, but we're warning people not to do it. Like, just <laughs> casually. Turtles stink. Hmm. Like, they really, really stink. I had a hairdresser who was quite good. And so I was willing to put up with the fact that she smelled like a turtle tank. What does that smell like? Oh, it is. How do I even describe it? It smells like, it smells a little bit like bleach that's gone off or something like that. It's a very unique smell. Uh, It smells like somebody, an unwashed person who has been dipped in some kind of terrible chemical. It's really, it's uriny, I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's really bad. In fact, that was like one of the best lines from Orange is the New Black, which, uh, if you've ever seen it, uh, there's one character who doesn't bathe out of protest, and the, this other character just goes, you smell like a turtle tank. Hmm. Like that, it, that's a, yeah, that's a really bad smell. So, uh, yeah, it'll make your whole house smell bad. Just really, really bad. And that it, and that's only if it doesn't give you salmonella, which I think 90% of them do have. Which is, is weird. Like, I heard that when I was a kid, and that was kind of enough to put me off turtles forever. Yeah. Like all reptiles, they, they tend to carry the bacteria salmonella. And so, like, these turtle moms and dads, as they refer to themselves, were even saying, like, if I put this on, like, a counter, I have to clean the counter afterwards. Like, anything <laughs> it touches has to be cleaned. So, so you might as well take care of a piece of raw chicken. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, don't do it. Turtles don't want to be your pets. No, especially, like, Gamera now takes on a whole new dimension, now that I know that he stinks. <laughs> yeah. Because he's horrifying. Because, like, on the one hand, like, you see a monster that's as cool as Godzilla. I mean, clearly that monster smells good. Like, he <laughs> probably smells like Old Spice. But uh, uh, Gamera, I mean, Christ, he, he probably smells like a million cat peas. Yeah, that's that's probably a good re- reference to it. Like anything kind of, you know how old urine smells? It's a little like that. Okay, see, because cat pee has, it's like regular pee, but fruity. <laughs> yeah. You can get a whiff of it in a wine. But yes, it's that, that old pee that's been sitting around for a week. That's that smell. So leave turtles alone. But, but do eat them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you ever eaten any reptile? Well, um, I've I've eaten I've eaten alligator. Oh, how was that? Uh, you know what? I I hate to say the cliche, but it really does just taste like chicken. Mm. It's like gamey chicken, and I was like, I like chicken, and I like the texture of things that are gamey, so I enjoyed it. Oh, okay. I've had frog's legs. And... Oh, I had those too, which are also like chicken. Yeah, but again, like a little bit more like dark meat and a little bit oilier. Yeah. It actually reminds me a little bit of duck meat. Well, duck meat is one of those things, and I get the, I get the sense that alligator and frog's legs are the same deal, where it's like, I've had duck and it's disgusting if someone doesn't know how to cook it, because mm-hmm. it just becomes like an oily mess. But if someone knows how to make duck, it's like the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never been tempted to eat turtle soup. In fact, I didn't even think it was a thing until I started watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and it was always the threat that Shredder gave to the turtles. Mm. I'm gonna turn you into turtle soup. Uh, the line is <laughs> tonight I dine on turtle soup. Tonight I dine on turtle soup. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, as said by the late James Avery, aka Uncle Phil, who was Shredder. Yeah. Um, I, I always thought that was a gag line. I never thought turtle soup was a real thing until much later. It's like, no, no, no. This is like a, a popular thing in Asia. I was like, what? That sounds like the grossest idea. Yeah, but uh, apparently turtles can be quite delicious. And it was one of the most popular dishes in America, at least, for most of the 19th and uh, I'd say half of the 20th century. 
you couldn't get if you had a recipe book it would absolutely have a recipe for turtle soup in it somewhere Hmm. and i have seen old recipe books so i know you're telling the truth there is often the token turtle recipe (laughs) (laughs) i have a, a i have a description of what the meat tastes like like is it is it watery? Is it is like does it just dissolve because it's like part of a soup? Is it better to have in a soup or do, do people bake turtle meat or, or fry it? So the people who still do it, it's not easy getting turtle meat as you can well imagine because they've got this whole shell thing going on <laughs> and they'll outrun you every time. <laughs> So you have to rip off the shell, which you need special tools for. And then they have a lot of what is known as yellow fat, which is apparently, like, disgusting. So you have to get rid of that. And then you end up with something, you know, that kind of looks like a like a plucked chicken <laughs> it's funny the first thing I, that i uh i searched for when i typed in yellow fat the uh, auto suggest was pokemon <laughs> really? it's like google that's that's called squirtle come on now uh. who's that pokemon <laughs> <laughs> so a large snapping turtle is said to contain several different types of meat each reminiscent of pork chicken beef shrimp veal fish or goat hmm Those less enamored of the protein might describe its flavor as muddy, dirty, mushy, and chewy, however. Oh, good. Dirty meat. My favorite. (laughs) Well, of course, you've heard the famous factoid that uh, for the longest time they didn't have a scientific name for the Galapagos turtle because they were never able to get a live specimen over to England because they were just too delicious. (laughs) Yeah, I've heard the rumor, but it's also like... It's hard to believe that anyone would want to eat something so disgusting. So they would have, in the 18th and 19th centuries, they have massive parties known as turtle frolics, which uh, <laughs> were apparently as as popular as like modern day barbecues. Like it was just something that everybody did. So I think, you know, part of the reason is there's a lot of snapping turtles in the U.S. So it's something that even though it takes a lot of care to prepare, Everyone has access to it. You know, you can just walk into a swamp and get a a nice turtle to eat. So it's kind of, it's, it's something that everyone from the richest to the poorest can have access to. Now, maybe this sounds as weird to some ears, uh, uh, you know, uh, as say going out and getting yourself a nice tasty lobster. But I hear you describe just going out to the swamp and get yourself a nice tasty turtle. And to me, it sounds like, ah, yes, you can very easily prepare a nice meal of steamed brick. (laughs) Um, And we should say when you're hunting for turtle, especially in the South, they're referred to as cooters. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, do you think that anyone prepares stuffed cooter? (laughs) We can only hope. So in well into the 20th century, you know, there was something that was uh, served on railway trains and the dining table. Like it, uh, it was canned for a while. For whatever reason, it didn't quite make the switch over to convenience food. And surprisingly, it wasn't because, as is usually the case with like modern eating trends, they ran out of turtles. It's just that taste just seemed to kind of change. As I mentioned before, turtles are a lot of work Mm. to get the meat. So something that people used as uh, alternative is mock turtle soup. And you know what that is made out of? No, what's the mock turtle in the mock turtle soup? Who put the mock in mock turtle soup? (laughs) The mock turtle was a calf head. Oh, which explains to me why, and I never really got this before, but uh, in Alice in Wonderland, they have a mock turtle. Mm. And, you know, it's a, it's a turtle with a calf's head that's crying. That's why. Because uh, mock turtle was actually the head of a calf. Okay. And that perhaps explains the otherwise inexplicable character introduced in Archie Comics, Cowlick, the flying cow head. Why would a giant cow head want to hang out with a bunch of turtles it's like well they're connected in the food chain so after this big description of uh turtle soup would you still like to eat some (laughs) no okay what if it's made out of ninja turtles no i mean like listen you've got michelangelo who's like a guy i'd want as my friend (laughs) <laughs> you've got like Raphael, who's a guy i would not want to be on bad terms with but i do not necessarily want as a friend you've got donatello who seems like a cool guy and leonardo who i do not like but do not wish to eat 
<laughs> Fair enough. Now, that we have touched on perhaps the most important myth from North America regarding turtles, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's why Gamera must seem like such a weird idea. And I confess, the first time I heard of Gamera, I thought it was a bizarre idea. And it was really only as time went on. It's like, wait a minute, though. It's like, in North America, we don't really have... Uh, there's nothing really that culturally significant about turtles, but that is not the case in other cultures. Right. So I'm I'm familiar with, I think it's the Hindu creation myth where the world is, is balanced on the back of a turtle. Yes. From what I understand, that's one of the forms of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. And of course, Vishnu carries uh, the world on its back. But there's a ton, a ton of other like turtles and tortoises in other kinds of myths. Like there's the Nigerian trickster, Ajapa the tortoise. There mm -hmm. is uh, another famous one, and it's also quite similar, is the Chinese turtle owl, uh, who the earth is under its shell and the shell is the sky. And the reason the shell is propped up is because two of his legs were cut off and that's propping the shell up above his body, which I guess is why they call him Ow. <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of makes sense that it would be a the turtle would be a mythical figure because they have such a distinct animal personality. Hmm. You know, if you really want to capture the idea of slowness, patience, silence, eternality, because they, they live so long, like that's a good animal to evoke all those things like i think of one of my favorite movies as a kid never ending story and they have one of the quests that atreyu has to go to is to meet this giant turtle who is as old as time and of course it'd be a turtle you know yeah. they're, they're the most li long-lived creatures out there oh wait can't uh what is it it can't alligators or crocodiles live longer than turtles don't they just keep growing or is that you're a thinking myth? of lobsters? <laughs> oh, I really hope lobsters keep grow growing. Imagine eating a 30-pound lobster. Oh, man. You could have before they were all farmed out. Oh, man. They maybe don't actually live forever. Mm -hmm. But we should mention, like we say that in North America, we don't hear it, but that's white North America. Uh, a lot of uh, indigenous people from, from the continent have a lot of myths about turtles. In fact, uh, the, where we live right now, uh, North America is referred to as Turtle Island. Hey, why are we Turtle Island? We don't give a damn about no turtles. <laughs> it's, uh, again, it's it's part of these um, creation myths that this continent is, is really kind of the back of a turtle, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's always such a, an interesting idea to me. And it's it's kind of funny how, like, as white North Americans, we're totally removed from that. Because, you know, the, the, the story behind the creation of the other famous mutated turtles, <laughs> um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja variety. Mm -hmm. Like, they were designed as a parody comic at first. And, like, the silliest idea that Eastman and Laird, the creators, could come up with was a turtle that knew ninjutsu. <laughs> like, it's it's deliberately meant to be as absurd as they could possibly uh, make it. And so you kind of see Gamera in the same light without any kind of context. Like, seeing Gamera, you know, you just think, oh, the filmmakers clearly thought Godzilla was green, even though, fun fact, Godzilla is charcoal gray. And they went with another green animal and they made it real big. <laughs> and for some reason, it breathes fire. Uh, but that's <laughs> that's not the case. Like the turtle, especially like in Asia, like the turtle is a is a big, important cultural figure and is used as a symbol of strength and wisdom among countless other things. Um, I know that in Chinese astrology, like uh, the, the turtle or the tortoise is one of like the four celestial animals. Right. So they call like the black tortoise the symbol for north, winter, and water. And there's like a Japanese counterpart to it that's named Guenbu. Hmm. So th there's enough of a significance there. And yet, but, so regardless, we're Turtle Island? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Especially among the Iroquois and the Ashinaabe. They, that's, that's how they refer to the land. Hmm. No, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I certainly like. I, I love that idea. I also love the variation on that image where the cosmic turtle 
is actually supporting four elephants and they're holding up the earth. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing how so many cultures from all over the world seem to have this idea of the turtle as like a foundational land piece of some kind. And it goes back to that idea of of portraying them as ancient and wise, which like when you see a turtle, chances are you see its wrinkled flesh and the fact that it moves quite slowly regardless of how old it is. So it just naturally makes you think of old. And when you think age, you think how age begets wisdom. So I, I, I could see it as like a series of jumps that way, but I, I, I cannot for a moment pretend that I know the more, uh, the deeper connection between uh, turtles and creation myths. Well, I guess I can see like what is the most unique thing about turtles. It's their shells, this weird kind of architectural quality they have. And they often have really beautiful geometric patterns on the back of their shells, right? There's almost something very constructed looking about them hmm. that makes it makes you think of like building and foundation. And maybe that's that's where the transfer came over. Yeah. I actually one of my favorite nineteenth century books it's about this dissipated french aristocrat who uh hides himself in a pleasure house uh to just (laughs) fill his like perverted weird ideas of of pleasure one of the things he does is he takes a turtle and uh bejewels the back of his um of of its shell with all these semi-precious stones and uh then he puts it on a beautiful oriental carpet just so he can just enjoy the, the contrast now when you said that a guy was going to enact like all of his most deepest of pleasures i was not thinking i'm going to decorate a turtle <laughs> well he was trying to pervert nature that was what his one of his one of the things he was trying to pervert it in order to improve it hmm. and this weird kind of twisted sort of dr frankenstonian frankensteinian experiment yeah, Frankenstone uh, is the Flintstone scientist. <laughs> and and so he just wanted to watch this turtle like lumber around on, on the carpet and enjoy like the strange thing he'd done to it. <laughs> uh, but the turtle ends up dying because they need the sh- their shells to breathe. <laughs> so it, it asphyxiated. Aww. <laughs> oh, that's a sad story. Yeah. Beth, it's time we asked that time honored question. Kenny, what gives? <laughs> exactly. Uh, did they ever follow up on that? Now, to my knowledge, because I know they asked, to my knowledge, there was never a segment in which they read out letters about what was wrong with Kenny, presumably because all the letters were too mean spirited. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I'm not one who usually is mean to kids, but it's so easy with this particular character. The kid that they chose, he's kind of, he's got this kind of like punchable face. And then the uh, the dubbing just makes him sound like such a whiny. I think it's done by a woman. I, th- right? I, I think and, it's mostly the dubbing that is responsible yeah. for Kenny being as irritating as he is. Yeah. And it's just like the utter, like what the, the bots were really frustrated with is like, there's no reason that anyone should be nice to this kid or give him so much power. Uh, and his logic could not be more flawed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, one of the things I like about the movie taken in isolation and not knowing the intention behind it is I kind of like how the rescue of Kenny plays out in the film where it, it seems kind of ambiguous. Like, Kenny lands in Gamera's hand and then Gamera immediately, like, throws him to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's no, yeah, I like the, that ambiguity throughout that, like, maybe this is just a really messed up kid. Because that makes the most sense, because they, they, they state, this is the one thing I, I don't understand, and this, this I guess, bronze it to ask, are Kenny's born or are they made? Be- <laughs> because it's established that Kenny is obsessed with turtles, really, because he's trying to fill the gap that his dead mother left him. <laughs> yeah, which, man, talk about, I, I know people grieve in their own ways, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it doesn't help that his dad's like, what about girls, Kenny? Girls. And he's like, no, turtles. <laughs> like, what stage of grief is the turtle worshipping stage? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, at no point have I ever locked myself in the closet and just hung out with some turtles for a while. <laughs> yeah, but my impression is this is very much like this this one real plot incoherence is the result of the director attempting to have his cake and eat it too. Which I will say in the reverse, because it turns out that makes much more sense if you say it the other way. If you eat your cake and have it too. Wait, but you would eat... As in, you eat your cake and then you have another cake? That doesn't make as much sense as having your cake and eat it too. No, you, you eat your cake and you have it too. Like, it's impossible. You're you're saying, you're enjoying the devouring of the cake, but you're also tr- tr- acting like it's still there, you know, that you can still possess it. But but see, like, to have your cake and eat it too would be like, you would have the cake, but it would not be immediately taken away from you. You get to also eat the cake. It's not just for show. <laughs> but, but that's not what that... Uh, that that idiom means. It means that you're trying to get both ways in a, in a possible situation. Now, Beth, I have it on good authority mm-hmm. because I just watched the McCain Deep and Delicious commercial in which Marie Antoinette, when she said, <laughs> let them eat cake, she clearly meant McCain Deep and Delicious cake. <laughs> so I learned all my idioms from the McCain Deep and Delicious people. <laughs> I stepped away for a minute and I have no idea how the conversation <laughs> got to this point. Listen, Kenny is a deep character who means a lot of things to a lot of people. So... What I mean is the director is trying to have it that he has a Godzilla-like world destroyer. While at the same time trying to hedge his bets, like, he had a hunch that these monster movies were much more popular with children than anyone ever expected. So he hedged his bets by having a kid character in it. So while you have a monster running amok, you still have this one little kid who uh, gives something for younger audiences to connect to. And he never really managed to get those two plot points to thread together. Yeah, because it, it can't. Like, can you imagine adding a child to the original Godzilla? <laughs> Unless that kid's getting stepped on. Unless that kid was insane, then it could kind of work. Which Kenny seems to be. <laughs> like, if he becomes kind of like a Lord of the Flies kid, who like, or like Apocalypse Now, who just worships him as a god. <laughs> and that's why, like, I think that Kenny is in place of the scientist part and there was even a character like this in the original godzilla where there's usually a scientist in 50s monster movies who says oh if only we could domesticate this horrible creature we'd learn so much and kenny is like if only we could domesticate this horrible creature who's not that horrible we'd earn so much love (laughs) all the love it'd be like all our dead mothers came back to life (laughs) ah but we know now that turtles aren't easily domesticated. <laughs> Let alone giant fire-breathing ones. I would also mention that this isn't something that you just see in camera movies. Uh, it was a weird cognitive dissonance that you see throughout the Silver Age of comics, where you had to have you know, a kid sidekick for your heroes and act like that's perfectly okay. And ignore the fact that they're probably seeing some really terrible, traumatizing shit. And eventually, you know, once we got to the Alan Moore stage of uh, Batman, for instance, they started dealing with the fact that Robin would be extremely traumatized. Like, if the Joker ever did get a hold of him, he would be destroyed. So this idea of having small children being sidekicks of superheroes is a terrible idea. Yet people were committed to it for so long because they were convinced that young kids needed that that substitute for themselves in the books that they were reading. See, that's odd, because there's a similar thing that happened in 80s media, where little kid characters would show up in franchises that you liked. You know, the second Indiana Jones movie, what did they do? They added a kid. Star Trek The Next Generation, they added a kid. Yep. The later episodes of The Real Ghostbusters, after they fired Lorenzo Music and the show went to they added the junior ghostbusters Uh, it was a thing and when i was a kid the last thing i ever wanted to see was a little kid exactly i would i was such a big fan of the conan doyle sherlock Holmes stories when i was a kid that if the baker street irregulars ever figured into any Holmes media i would immediately give up watching or reading it because i so hated kids in fiction you don't want to read about kids. Especially when you see kids getting cu- the kinds of privileges that you know would never actually be forwarded to them. It seems unfair. And I feel like maybe that's the point that like the bots are really getting angry about, is like this kid is getting privileges that 
he just has not earned, you know? Yeah, his point that Gamera is a turtle who loves, or at least loves children, is taken, not only is taken with a bit of weight by Dr. Hadaka, but the fact that he's brought to Hadaka in the first place <laughs> and gets to show up at the army and ride that train and everything, even though he's just causing a ruckus. Like, he gets to be in those situations in the first place. It's one of those things that's frustrating. Yeah, audience substitutes. Don't do them. No. Now, with Kenny, I mean, I, I don't know if he has a punchable face. I think par- partially it's the outfit he's wearing. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that plays a major factor. Uh, Kenny was played by a child actor named Yoshiro Uchida. And he got his start like as a proper trained stage actor with the Himawari theatrical troupe. And what we're seeing in Gamera is his first film appearance. But after conquering stage and screen... Uh, Yuchida had a literal song in his heart and released his first single in 1971. He became a singer. Whoa, wow. Yeah, the real voice of Kenny, I guess. Uh, that was as sweet as syrup. Uh, and later he would perform vocals with the band The Four Leaves. Uh, I, I found a song of theirs called Epitaph, which I believe Yuchida sings on. So we'll have a link in the show notes there. And though he's no longer with The Four Leaves... Uh, Uchida still sings today in his new career as a chanteur, which is what the Japanese call a singer of French songs. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, so Kenny's doing well for himself. It looks like if you're a child actor in Japan, uh, you don't immediately become a meth head. <laughs> oh, good for you. Good for you, Kenny. I'm glad something gave for Kenny. Hey, everybody, it's time for the Shadow 13. All right, it's time for The Shallow 13. 13 bits of Gamera Obscura about this episode and the movie Gamera. Go, Beth, go! Crow mistakenly reads the title of this movie as Camera. Gamera was originally named Kamera, based on the Japanese word for turtle, Kame. Since this is identical to how the Japanese pronounce the word camera, Kamera, Gamera's opening consonant was altered for more pleasing lip and tongue action in Japan. Jun Osanai, who appears here as the sea captain of the Chidori Maru, was in a lot of Dai films. Kaiju researcher August Ragon claims he appeared in over 100 films for Dai Studios, but the IMDb only lists 34, including an appearance as a defense force officer in Gamera vs. Barugan. Nora, Kenny's teenage sister, was originally scripted to be his mother before a revision left Kenny's father with two kids and no wife. 60s media had a weird thing about widowed single dads, so much so that MST3K devoted an entire sketch about widowed dads in 60s sitcoms in season 5's Iga. The Inuit chief is played by Japanese character actor Yoshio Yoshida, who later crossed over to monster movies with greater name recognition by appearing in 1972's Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Now, for those keeping track, Yoshida appeared in one of the most down-to-earth entries in the Silly Gamera series, and the silliest film in the more realistic Godzilla series. Whether through carelessness or indifference, the American actors playing U.S. Air Force pilots are credited only by their last names, Brown, Richardson, Strihan, Hartman, and Ranson. Aichi Funakoshi, the prolific actor who appears as Dr. Hadaka, only became an actor because he was the victim of a prank. Funakoshi had been entered into a Fresh Faces contest by his brother as a goof, but it led to a career that spanned from 1948 to 1992. Funakoshi, for Japanese audiences, would have attracted, as his name had considerable marquee value. Funakoshi would return for one more Gamera film in 1969. Bokuzen Hidari appears here as a drunken farmer and would be a familiar face to Japanese audiences, having appeared in Akira Kurosawa's Ikiru and The Seven Samurai also as a farmer. Comedian and actor Hidari was essentially the Foster Brooks of the East, specializing in playing drunks, even though he himself abstained from drink. An American scientist seen in the film is Enver Alton Bay. That's not Pig Latin, that's his name. A bit player in a number of Japanese sci-fi films, Alton Bay was a Turkish man living in Japan and was often employed by Japanese directors to play stock American roles. The exact number of appearances he made are well, it's hard to pinpoint, since plenty of his roles were uncredited, as was the case in Gamera. But he did have a small role in the first film ever mistied, 1968's The Green Slime, riffed in the unaired MST3K pilot. The scene in which Gamera knocks over Tokyo Tower had to be saved in editing when the tower miniature fell of its own accord during filming before Gamera could even come near it. 
The production team filmed an extreme close-up of Gamera's hands gripping the tower and inserted it between shots of Gamera approaching the still-standing tower and its premature fall, making it look like it fell over through the power of Gamera after all. Tokyo Tower has also been prominently featured in such kaiju films as the Toho Rankin Bass co-production King Kong Escapes, the Millennium-era Godzilla films Tokyo SOS and Final Wars, as well as serving as a plot point in 1995's Gamera reboot Guardian of the Universe. In that 90s Gamera film, Tokyo Tower is home to a nest of Gausses, the bat creatures introduced in 1967's Gamera vs. Gauss. In another bit of monster movie tourism, we get a glimpse of Mount Mihara when it erupts late in the film. Mahara would nearly kill Godzilla in 1984's Return of Godzilla, and would serve as the site of the monster's glorious reemergence in 1989's Godzilla vs. Violante. Seeing producer Hidemasa Nagata's name in the credits, Crow quips, oh, That's Japanese for in a gata de vida. Oh, it's, huh? <laughs> or I got into the Gouda. Hidemasa Nagata doesn't have any weird nicknames that we know of, but his father, Masaichi, the founder of Dai Studios, was known to employees as the Trumpet. The episode marks the debut of writer Colleen Williams, a.k.a. Colleen Henjum, a.k.a. Colleen Henjum Williams. She would write for the show until the season six finale, Samson vs. the Vampire Women. Williams lived the dream as she not only wrote for MST3K in its prime, but also worked from home for most of, if not all, of her tenure on the show. Best Brains would send her a copy of the film with a time code, and she'd submit her jokes by fax. And that's time! All right, Matt, so fun fact that w- would have been too much for the Shadow 13 would have ultimately made it a Shallow 14. Mm-hmm. But I, uh, I I feel compelled to mention it. <laughs> okay, so how do you think Gamera was promoted in the U.S.? What would you use as the tagline for Gamera? I would say something like the second coming of Godzilla or something like that. The tagline for Gamera was, don't come if you scare easy. <laughs> <laughs> Which just sounds like a weird double entendre, too. Yeah. Yeah, it does. That tagline is not music to my ears. Well, speaking of the music, the actors were obviously dubbed into English. Did they do anything to the soundtrack, or is this the original? Hmm. Well, let's uh, let's go someplace private to discuss that, Beth. You see, if you flip a turtle on its back, it can't move, but it can still groove. <laughs> Which is why it's time to retract our limbs into our shells and do the Gamera dance. All right, let's go to the score corner, also known as the Scorner. All right, so to answer your question, yes, it's totally the same score. All right. And honestly, if things seem a little bit rough, I have to cut this movie a lot of slack. And in a way, I'm I'm quite impressed. Like, the film's editing, score, sound mix, all of that, if it seems rough, it might be because the film only had 16 days of post-production. Oh. Or no, not even that. Sorry. It, it opened 16 days after production wrap, so it would have had even less for post-production. The last day of filming was November 11th, 1965, and it opened 16 days later. So that's nothing to edit and score the film. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, so I I was quite impressed. Like, initially, like, when you sit down and watch the movie, the score is most interesting for what it isn't. Like, there's no Gamera song that we're all used to. And, like, the cool jazz rock fusion that I associate with the Gamera series for, like, uh, Guiron and Zegra, the later sequels that we get on this show, that kind of scoring is nowhere to be heard. Right. And obviously there's a lot of influence from the Godzilla soundtrack here. The You know, the kind of doomy, portentous orchestral music to suggest that something bad is about to happen at any moment. There's there's a lot of inspiration there, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And it's funny, like it comes off more in the film, I guess, as you get carried away in the movie, there's not as much of it listening to it on the album as I initially thought. Like... The the score didn't make a huge impression on me while I was watching the movie, but when I acquired a copy of it and just listened to it in isolation, I was actually kind of impressed. Hmm. So uh, the score is done by Tadashi Yamauchi, and he would later score 
one of the sequels. He would score uh, Gamera vs. Gauss. But he had also scored uh, the critically acclaimed Manji the year prior to Gamera and other movies such as The House of Wooden Blocks, as well as a movie called Shibire Kurage, uh, more, <laughs> which is described on IMDb as more of a sex melodrama than an actual Yakuza film, but it has Yakuza elements. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but uh, the score was interesting to listen to because – you get drums and strings for Gamera. And what I found interesting is that, oh, it's, it's cool to compare uh, Godzilla and Gamera for their respective debuts because uh, Godzilla is more about kind of like eerie piano and strings and often dissonant sounds rather than like, even though Godzilla has a theme, it, it, it's more to create an atmosphere for a monster than uh, score the monster uh, and give him this kind of cohesion. Like it's it's more about making sure the audience comes away unsettled. Uh, where it's here, it seems to be more about kind of drumming up suspense, no pun intended, for Gamera with drums and strings all the time, just to not communicate any kind of personality for the creature, but instead convey a sense of scale. Uh, that's the impression that I got listening to the soundtrack because the rest of it is comparatively quiet. And I really enjoyed those quieter sections. <laughs> like, I came away really liking it. Yeah, it's really not an, a score that brings a lot of attention to itself. The only time I really noticed it was at the beginning and end credits as the kind of ominous music over the shots of the water, mm -hmm. which I actually think is one of the most artistic touches of this movie. Yeah, they, even though they don't really do a heck of a lot with water, but I like the touch that they have on to bookend this film. Yeah, because we we never see Gamera coming out of the waters. We see Godzilla come out of the waters, but Gamera comes out of the ice, or he comes from the sky because he's spinning around and is mistaken as a UFO. Um, yeah. But the cool stuff that you get in the soundtrack is there's a theme for uh, Kenny, aka Toshio. Uh, and it's often done as kind of like a melancholy sax tune. And it's like, oh, this is weird. I'm used to my sax being sultry. Hmm. But there, it, it really works at conveying a lonely, caring child much better than the two dubs that I have now seen of the original camera. <laughs> and there's even a really great uh, track for uh, Alex or Ayoge. Uh when he's confessing his feelings for Catherine or Kyoko uh, is a track on the soundtrack called Good Luck Charm, which is scored with electric guitar and is again done in this kind of like subtle melancholy way. It's got this great kind of downbeat sixties charm that I really, that I really like. And in fact, I would say that the score is characterized mostly by this really good guitar work, often with the yeah. Toshio character and this is where one of the weirdest things in this dub and in both dubs of the movie finally made sense. Kenny's turtle's name. Why is he called Tibby? <laughs> Who names anything Tibby? <laughs> is Tibby even a name? Um, I suppose the in the Heat of the Night sequel, they call me Mr. Tibby Counts. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally got it when I was looking over the translated uh, track list. It's Chibi. Oh. Chibi. Chibi oh, is the like Japanese little... word for small. Right. Okay. That makes sense. It does. That finally like brings that all together. Um, because there's a, a great track... Uh, called Toshio Searches for Chibi. And you hear the Toshio Kenny theme on guitar, which is accompanied by my favorite instrument, the vibraphone. Mm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Yamauchi, d despite the fact that he's not one of the composers I'm really, really familiar with, uh, seems quite interesting. He was born in 1927 on August 22nd, which makes him a Virgo like me. <laughs> Uh, he comes from a uh, pretty good stock because his father was a silent actor and his brother would then take part in talkies and would be a fairly successful actor. And he wanted to become a violinist and he studied music. And the only thing that prevented him from following up on that is nerve damage from World War II and he could no longer play. No. So he had to study uh, essentially composing and conducting in order to still make music part of his life. And he studied under Akira Fugube in 1953, Ifugube being the guy who scored and created the musical identity for Godzilla, 
the following year in 1954. Wow, there's the connection. All right. Yeah, yeah. He he again, he he seems to have overcome like a fairly like tragic life. He he lost his ability to play violin and then after World War II, uh his home was destroyed in an allied firebombing. Lord. So even with the fairly, you know, apolitical uh Gamera which doesn't have any of the kind of tone or or uh anti-american sentiment of the original godzilla uh you know people were still people involved were still very much feeling those things even if it wasn't explicitly put in the film like he became a a pacifist uh and would often uh whenever possible go to uh speak out against war of any kind right I really liked that your explanation of how uh, this composer doesn't use instruments in a cliche way. Like the saxophone isn't sultry. The electric guitar isn't youthful and brash, like a willingness to kind of find new ways for these instruments to have a language. It's really interesting. Yeah. You know, when you hear about kind of uh, electric guitar or steel guitar in the 60s like you automatically think of say Vic Flick for the James Bond scores where he would do his guitar solos and I was like this doesn't sound anything like that hmm. nor does it sound like any of the other Gamera scores it's it's really interesting in and of itself so uh, I'm, I'm glad I actually paid extra attention and got this soundtrack it's it's quite good ah, well well Chris while I put this calf's head on the boil overnight do you have any final factoids for us i do adam you just asked a little while ago whether tibby was actually a name and it is what it totally is it is it's a nickname for tabitha wow so in the sisterhood of the traveling pants there is a character whose birth name is tabitha but she goes by tibby but it's also a nickname for isabel Hmm. And it's also been used as a nickname for Albert, because Tibby knows no gender. (laughs) And similarly, it's been used as a nickname for Tibor, the Hungarian and Eastern European name. Tibor. And most excitingly, uh, it's also been used as a nickname for Elizabeth. Elizabeth is one of those names that has a zillion different versions. Yeah. I should know. That's right, Dr. Tibby. (laughs) I should have been Betty. That would have been a better version. Yeah, well, it's not too late, Beth. It's not too late. Tiffy's pretty good, too, frankly. All right, I'll think about it. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you're named Tibby, or if you'd like to ask Beth and Adam anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, or we're on Twitter at it is just a show. We would love to hear from you. In fact, this show is made possible by listeners like you. You can help us by writing in, by talking about us on social media, or you can make us all very, very happy by supporting us on Patreon. And Patreon supporters can hear a bonus bid with more about Jim Varney by going to itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today on It's Just a Show, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 43. All right, that's enough turtling for one. (laughs) Oh, gross. Yeah. That's enough turtling for one month. What are we going to do next? I need relief from this turtling. (laughs) Well, friends, we just watched one movie twice. And so what if next time... We watch two episodes of a TV show that are pretending to be a movie. That always works out, right? Oh, yeah. On this show, yes. <laughs> well, let's find out with KTMA Episode 10, Cosmic Princess. Ooh, a.k.a. Space 1999. Oh, hey, I remember that. Uh, I think I watched it when I was a kid, uh, you know, pre-critical ability and actually enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, my uncle had a Space 1999 lunchbox, and even as a kid, I made fun of him for it. <laughs> You're mean. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, KTMA by episode 10, they, they probably got into some kind of groove that might be interesting to see. I say more more KTMA means more KTMA. I'm all for this. Mm. If all goes according to plan, the episode will drop on the 30th anniversary of the first airing of that episode mm. on January 22nd, 1989. Wow. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. And until next time, this turtle has been flipped. We are done. And don't forget, 
If Gamera was a Ninja Turtle, he'd be Raphael, because he's rude but cool. Wait, is it a cool but rude? It's cool but rude. <laughs> okay, because he's cool but rude. Let's go over this. Now, Leonardo <laughs> is the leader, and uh, Raphael is cool but rude. Uh, Donatello does machines, and Michelangelo is a party dude. Excellent. Well, take it away, theme squad.